Hello everyone, I'm Shannon Morrall with Tax Analyst. Thank you for joining us today for another episode in our weekly discussions on tax reform. Now today it's very exciting. We are actually outside the Tax Analyst offices. We are at Jones Day in Washington, D.C. And I am joined by Scott Levine, who is a partner at Jones Day, and Alex Reed, who is a partner with Morgan Lewis. And we're going to be talking about comprehensive tax reform, of course. So. Um, thank you both for joining us today. Sure. We're very excited to talk with you. Um, let's start off by talking about why is tax reform suddenly such a hot topic? Um, people have been complaining about you know the tax code for years, if not decades. So it's really not anything new, and especially with the tax filing deadline coming up, we're really hearing a lot about it. Um, but previous good faith efforts into tax reform really didn't go anywhere. I mean, we look at you know the Dave Camp. Uh, bill that completely fell flat, despite a lot of good effort and a lot of good ideas put into it. So why now in 2017? Um, we speak about this whole window of opportunity for tax reform. Um, what's really behind that? Why now? Well, sure. <laughs> sure, I'll take it. Uh, well, so we have a planetary alignment. We have the White House, uh, the House of Representatives, and the Senate all controlled by the same party. Yes. Uh, in theory, at least. Uh, yes. We've seen some, some uh, disagreement within the party, but sure. um, but once you have that planetary alignment, that makes it possible to really achieve your legislative priorities. And tax reform has been the number one uh, uh, legislative priority for Republicans for a long time. Um, so I would say that's why now. Um, in addition to that, we have some uh, some long-standing tax policy problems that uh, yes. we've been trying to fix for a long time and interested in. The main one being um, the corporate tax rate, the statutory tax rate is very high, which creates distortions uh, between the choice to finance your company with debt or equity, and it creates distortions um, of choosing U.S. versus abroad to headquarters. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's that's a, that's a probably an important segue is, well, yes, the, the, the planets may have aligned in some respect, the system's pretty much broken down in the corporate sphere. And so what you've seen is, is, I don't want to call it a race to the bottom, but you've seen a shift from countries like Switzerland, Luxembourg, maybe the Netherlands that historically have always had low tax rates, to larger, like, thriving metropolises, like, like um, the UK, for example, um, that have now gone down as low as 18 or 17 percent, and now under Brexit, suggesting that um, they would go as low as 15 percent. And so it's just too easy to move. Yeah. And so what we're seeing now is that if the system doesn't get fixed now, it, it, it might be too late. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. So let's talk about really the main proposal out there right now, which is the House GOP blueprint. That's all we've been really hearing about for you know the past couple months. Um, and it's really unique as far as tax proposals go. I mean, it would be a significant departure from our current corporate tax um, income tax. It envisions like a set of rate reductions on the individual side. And then, probably most interestingly, most controversially, um, a destination-based cash flow tax on the business side. So let's focus on the latter. How do you think a cash flow tax would work in practice for most companies? And um, really, any guesses as to whether you think it would help promote capital formation and boost the overall economy? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> you have to divide this into two. So let's, we're gonna first talk about the cash flow piece. We'll talk about border addressing maybe a little yeah. bit. Um, the cash flow piece is just what it sounds like. It, it bases, the tax is based on the cash flow of a corporation or a business as opposed to something else. And so, in essence, any purchases or anything else that occurs is immediately expensed or deducted 100% as sure. long as it's depreciated or amortized over time. Um, and then any income that's earned is, is immediately potentially subject to tax. Um, and the concerns here, uh, on the one hand is you create like kind of uh, two camps. On the one hand, one camp you have what I'll call purely domestic corporations. Those okay. corporations are general and, and, and smaller. They're gonna be able to take advantage immediately of, of, uh, of the ability to expense something right away. Their, their cash flow is usually tighter and the ability to deduct something all up front is a, is a windfall. Okay. Um, on the other side, you have like large multinationals. And those large multinationals tend to be publicly traded. They don't really care about timing as much because it's all about their effective tax rate and gap. And being able to expense something versus amortize it over time or depreciate it over time isn't that big of a benefit. 
And so it's interesting to see that the two, the two uh, groups at play here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that was a great summary of, of, of what the proposal is and, and how it's working. Um, I just want to step back a little bit and provide a little more, more context for, for where, this is, where this is coming from. Um, in the first question you asked about um, why now and, and why some yeah. of the previous uh, efforts have failed and, and what we kind of said is what's really driving this is uh, business tax reform, corporate tax. Um, the, the blueprint is a direct response to that and it includes some provisions that uh, relate to individuals as well. Why? Because a lot of business income is in earned in pass-through form. So if you're going to do something for businesses, you have to also do something for individuals, otherwise you leave out all the pass-throughs and small businesses that aren't organized in corporate form. So the blueprint is taking, um, uh, is, a, is a way of addressing this situation with business tax reform in a comprehensive way that addresses both pass-throughs so on the individual side and corporations on the corporate side. The, 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 the larger point that I'd like to make in, and, and talking about uh, tax, previous tax reform efforts and why some of them have foundered on the rocks is you have to really, to understand what tax reform is, you have to realize there, there are always two components when you're talking about tax reform and distinguishing tax reform from a tax cut. Okay. Mm, yeah. So a tax cut is where you just simply reduce rates or eliminate a tax and that uh, gives money to whoever you've reduced the taxes on. Tax reform is a rate, is a, it's a cut combined with an increase. Okay, so you're, you're inevitably, when you're doing tax reform, you are increasing taxes on somebody and you are cutting taxes on somebody else. All right, so it is an inherently challenging political thing to accomplish because no one wants their taxes to be increased, particularly not if what they're getting in return for that is worse than what they have presently. Okay, so the, the objective and why tax reform is so difficult is because everyone who loses something in tax reform has to get something better or else you create enemies of, of the legislation. Um, so. Um, there have been various attempts at accomplishing tax reform. Um, the 1986 style is where you eliminate a lot of uh, tax benefits, but what you get in return is substantially lower tax rates. So in, in 1986, the top marginal individual income tax rate was 50%, and by eliminating tax shelters and passive activity losses and a variety of things, they're able to bring that rate down from 50% to 28%. So the deal was a good one. You might have lost your ability to use passive activity loss tax shelters, but what you got in return was a reduction of your marginal rate from 50% to 28%. People liked that deal. Sure. Reagan was a hero, and it was Absolutely. a hero, right? And it was a great, it was a great bit of, of, it was complicated, it took a few years, but it worked. Um, and Alex, that's probably yeah. why it's so difficult uh, to do this comprehensive reform as opposed to just having what was like Sam's a camp, a, a targeted mm -hmm. proposal just on corporations and an international tax that could be a, a surgical strike in and out as opposed to once you open it up to everybody, everybody's got to have some. Absolutely. Right. That's yeah. right. And, and, and so um, that model, the, the, the heroism of the, of the 86, everyone wants that again. Yeah. We want to do that again. Let's, it's like, let's have a sequel to that movie, because that was a great movie. Yeah. And the problem is, it's, there's not enough to cut to get that rate reduction. Yeah. So um, in, in 2012, the super committee, it was 2012, the super committee got together and said, let's do tax reform. Let's do 86 style tax reform. We'll broaden the, the base and drop the rates, mm -hmm. and everybody will be happy. And they looked at it and they weren't able to get enough income from broadening the, 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 the base. So it read that, yeah, the tax increase caused a lot of pain, but there wasn't enough revenue generated from sure. it to yeah. give enough of a tax cut to make people happy. So 
the super committee effort kind of failed. That was all behind closed doors. We never saw the legislation that came out of that. It was mostly uh, revenue estimators working with the policymakers to try to come up with something that worked, and it didn't. Uh, the camp bill was a very serious effort to do a base broadening, rate reducing, comprehensive tax reform, which inflicted a great deal of pain on a lot of people. Um, but again, the, the cuts were not that substantial. The, the top marginal rate just doesn't get down, doesn't get down anywhere near 28%. Mm -hmm. And so why inflict that much pain if you're not gonna get the benefit? Yeah. That's why the camp bill was kind of a, a dead letter or introduced, it was, it was really introduced as a staff draft. Camp's name wasn't even attached to it until the very end. So now, this with this new proposal, we'll bring it to the president. I'm sorry <laughs> yeah, for, for going on. No, I think the context is very the important. The context is yeah. important. So this new proposal says, okay, forget camp, forget uh, base broadening rate reduction through 86 style reform. Yeah. We're going to do something completely different. Radical, even. Radical. Yeah. We're going to tax uh, imports, and we're going to basically what they're doing is they're they're. They're saying, okay, instead of just focusing on the income tax base, mm -hmm. which is a narrow base, and having high rates on a narrow base, we're gonna tax another base, we're gonna tax the consumption tax base, and that will allow us to tax consumption a bit, and drop the amount that we tax income a bit, and then we're, uh, we have a much broader base. So it's, it's kind of brilliant, it goes towards a, a value-added tax, which is what the rest of the world does. Um, and it's, it's a way of, of solving that that metric, but as Scott was explaining, the problem is you create winners and losers. Even though there are a lot of winners by re by reducing rates that way, there are some losers or some people who believe who believe they will be losers, and they're mobilized against them. Absolutely, I think I'm glad you brought the context into it because I think that's really important when we're talking about this. So we kind of touched on it, and so yeah. let's just elaborate just a little bit more. You know, separate from the cash flow tax as part of the blueprint is this border adjustment tax. And that's really what's been most controversial and getting the most you know, pushback. Um, the concept, generally speaking, is that we exempt the um, export sales from the tax base, um, but we tax imports. And so it's not a tariff, and it, it's not exactly um, a VAT, like you, you said, it's got similarities. Um, can you just run us briefly through the details of this border adjustment tax? and? Um, and talk about maybe the pros and cons of that approach. Scott. Uh, sure. <laughs> well, first of all, you. It, it's fair to say that, that when you say the, de the details. Yeah, the details. They, they emerge of maybe two paragraphs in the blueprint, which um, isn't quite long to begin with. Yes. So there aren't really any details. The details come from a, a number of papers that have been written by economists mm -hmm. and, and uh, attorney tax lawyers and other tax professionals about you know, postulating like, what would this look like, what could it look like. Okay. But you have the general gist of it correct. So for, so in essence, if you are a, a U.S. Uh, corporation or U.S. business and you manufacture or make something in the United States or provide services in the United States and you provide them or, or sell those products to another person in the United States, it's just going to be the normal system that, that generally exists to take into account the cash flow that we just mentioned before. If you are a U.S. manufacturer or service provider providing those uh, products or services out of the United, to export them out of the United States, mm -hmm. Two things. Number one, you would not be subject to any tax in the United States. And number two is you get a complete deduction for all of your expenses. So by definition, if you are a net exporter, in theory, you would have an, a, a permanent net operating loss. And the more of an exporter you are, the bigger that loss. Yeah. So we'll get back to that in a moment, what, what the problems that that might arise, that, that might arise from that. Secondly, if you are a, uh, an importer, so if you are a retailer, for example, um, yeah. I don't want to name any specific names, but we all know who they, the big ones are, Big box retailer. Um, most if most of your uh, products are, are imported from from abroad. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in apparel, for example, I understand 97% of apparel is manufactured outside the United States. Yeah. That's also not going to come back. I mean, the, the the labor markets are such that no matter how much of a tax you put on it, it will almost never make sense to manufacture apparel in the United States. So in that case, if you're a net importer, you will um, you will basically be importing the product. You pay a certain amount. And then you won't be able to deduct any of that amount um, when, and you'll be subject to a 20% tax. 
And so to put it in perspective, if you are your big box retailer, you import your Sony television set, uh, you, you pay um, $100 for that television set, and you sell it for $110, um, margins, if you're lucky to have a margin like that, um, you would have um, $110 of revenue, you pay, um, what is that, a $22 tax on a 20% tax, um, and you've only actually made before tax $10. So you're actually out of pocket $12 in that situation. Now, why does this maybe make sense, maybe not? Well, the economists believe, um, at least I should say some economists believe, some economists believe that, the, that the, uh, the US dollar will sufficiently strengthen to completely offset any impact, positively or negatively, of, for both importers and exporters. Well, why are exporters ecstatic about this tax? If it's gonna offset, they should be indifferent, right? And the same goes for retailers. Why are they so apoplectic about this tax? it should offset as well. I think if you talk to other groups of, of um, economists, they tend to be more in the private sector as opposed to maybe academia. Um, you start pulling little levers or little pieces of their laboratory that determines when the, how that FX would occur, how that US dollar would strengthen. And it turns out that um, there, it might not be so it's such an efficient market. Why should we believe there is one? We know certain things, for example, that our US dollars will never uh, that, that that will have a very little impact on. For example, uh, crude crude uh, oil is is um, subject to on the world markets is in the U.S. dollars, so yeah. that's not going to change. Likely, even maybe more importantly, the vast majority it seems this is anecdotal, but it seems to be the case of global supply contracts that that are they have been negotiated already that they exist in their long term are in U.S. dollars. So even if this hap even if we do have this this event occur. The economists who are saying would snap in a second to the, uh, the right place, it's not likely to happen. So I think most people in that camp would estimate that it's going to move some way, maybe halfway or somewhere around there, but it won't be sufficient to offset or ameliorate the, the impact. That's, that's the one thing to, to keep in mind there. Let's go back then to this, this issue about this NOL, because I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so you are a net exporter. Um, you are a, a big exporter. All you do is export. You're, you're, Boeing, you're, you're one of the big exporters. Um, what's going to happen? You're going to have um, a massive net operating loss. Well, that sounds great if you're that company. You get NOL because you get to expense. You've expensed all of your costs and you have no tax. <laughs> so Sounds good. Yeah, sounds it doesn't great. get any better than that. <clears throat> so the problem is, <clears throat> if you believe that the, the exchange rate is going, the dollar will strengthen, mm -hmm. well, you need to be able to monetize that net operating loss. In essence, you need to be able to use that net operating loss to offset the fact that the dollar is stronger and your exports will not be able to be sold at the same price because Europe and the rest of the world won't be able to afford to pay the same amount they did before because they're, assuming it's all reciprocal, the euro, the, the, the yen is, le is worth less. Sure. So, they have to, how do they monetize it? Well, some, there's been a bunch of discussion that's been floating around Washington about how that might occur. <clears throat> One possibility is Congress could just allow the government to cut a check to these companies every year. I would think politically that's about as likely as, um, I don't know, uh, them singing Kumbaya in Congress <laughs> for the next, you know, on, on, on the whole of the steps. Free money for corporations? <clears throat> yeah, free money for corporations. That's a nice ring to it. That's a nice ring to it, sure. The second possibility is that they just do something um, akin to safe harbor le leasing back in the, in the early 80s. In essence, one of two ways to do that. Either allow companies to buy and sell their net operating losses to companies that can use them, or back in the 19, early 80s with safe harbor leasing, allow unrelated companies to file a consolidated tax return, which sounds crazy in today's world. Like that. So you get rid of 3A2 and. <clears throat> you get rid of all the 3A2 and all the loss trafficking provisions that are out there. What would we do for a living? Well, here's what we would do for a living. <laughs> The first two things I just mentioned, I think, are very are very <laughs> unlikely to pass because politically, I think that would be very challenging to allow that to happen. So, what does that leave us with? Self help. That means that pick two companies. That means that Boeing, who now has a multi-billion-dollar net operating loss, saddles up with I don't know Walmart, who has been uh, is importing everything and has this terrible effect of tax rates that they can't stay in business. And now you have these giant manufacturers teaming up with retailers, and they, they merge, and they are able to use each other's losses. So no one pays any tax at all? Nobody pays any tax, because if you believe in an efficient market, which I somewhat do, 
we will, us lawyers will take care of the inefficiencies. We'll take our 5% cut, but it'll be yeah. 5%. <laughs> so think, including the bankers as well. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, that's great. So that's let's talk about something that's not always in the conversation about tax reform. Let's talk about the tax exempt sector, a sector that usually doesn't pay taxes. Um, so there's really a broad reach of, of entities that are affected by this. And most universities and colleges are tax exempt, many hospitals, um, healthcare organizations, uh, charities, NGOs, um, think tanks, churches. So that's a lot, of, a lot of different people and a lot of different organizations. So what aspects of the tax reform debate matter most to these groups? Okay, well, uh, I'll take that one. I, I uh, represent a lot of uh, tax exempt organizations. Okay. So, um, let's see, it depends on which bill we're talking about. If we're talking about the blueprint. Let's focus on the blueprint. Let's focus on the yeah. blueprint. Uh, focusing on the blueprint, so we don't have a lot of the details about um, anything other than uh, who, who's going to get, get rate reductions and, um, and some of the provisions about international. Um, but there are a lot of indirect effects on exempts as a result of changes to the individual tax rate. And this is because uh, exempts receive a lot of charitable contributions that are deductible by individuals. So um, when you reduce marginal tax rates on individuals, the value of the charitable deduction also decreases. So the incentive, the tax incentive effect of the charitable deduction decreases proportionately with the income tax rate reductions. So that has a big impact indirectly on the tax exempt sector uh, whenever you reduce rates. And we've seen that the data bears that out. At any time you have a rate cut, uh, exempts suffer a, a big hit in terms of their charitable gifts. And Alex, this, you're assuming that the base broadening doesn't somehow gobble up the, the deduction completely. Right, so the base broadening aspect of it, um, we don't know if there's going to be some of the camp provisions um, that would have a direct impact on exempt. So um, the blueprint may well be combined with camp. Um, and camp, the, the, the deal with, with the camp bill was that uh, the tax increase was broadly distributed and the tax decrease was broadly distributed. That was kind of the magic of that bill. And so everyone had to chip in, so they went out of their way to make sure that the exempts were also chipping in. Um, and in theory, at least, everyone would benefit. So there were a couple of things that, that helped exempts there. In my view, not enough to just, particularly in light of the amount of, uh, of um, provisions that directly and negatively affected exempts in that bill. But that kind of menu is, is still there. So if you take the blueprint and you get rid of the money raiser from the border adjustment tax, you're left with how do you find the money to get to deliver those rate cuts? The answer is through base broadening and you're back to camp. Um, a couple of other effects, indirect effects that are important from the from the the details in the blueprint. Um, uh, they're talking about doubling the standard deduction, which is a uh, sort of a, a brilliant piece of, of political uh, tax policy because by doubling the standard deduction, you give um, a tax benefit to individuals who don't have enough itemized deductions to be able to claim the standard deduction. And the individuals who have are most likely to not have enough uh, state and local tax and mortgage interest deduction and charitable gifts are in red states. So it's kind of a, an amazing way to deliver a tax benefit to people living in red states without um, affecting people who live in blue states, which is why it's a, uh, uh, the doubling the standard deduction is a feature of most, uh, it's the president in the president's bill, it's in the blueprint, and it's probably it affects exempts because um, if you claim the standard deduction rather than itemized deductions, mm -hmm. you are unable to claim uh, the charitable deduction. So right now, a 
about 33% of people itemize, meaning 30, 33% of people are able to claim the charitable deduction rather than a standard deduction. If you double it, you get to 95% of people claiming the standard deduction and only 5% of people itemizing. So only 5% of taxpayers will be able to claim their charitable deduction. Wow. So that really <clears throat> changes both the amount given to charity and which charities receive uh, contributions. Those that are supported by middle class <coughs> donors uh, would be more adversely affected than those from the very from the top 5%. Um, one other point, uh, the estate tax is likely to be repealed as well, and the estate tax has an unlimited charitable contribution deduction. Um, so eliminating the estate tax will also have a negative impact uh, indirectly on charities as a result of a reduced incentive to make charitable bequests. Thank you. All right, so let's briefly talk about an upcoming conference on comprehensive tax reform that is actually going to be hosted here at Jones Day. Um, so it's, it's hosted by the DC Bar Tax Section, Tax Analysts, and Jones Day. And um, it's, it's titled, Preparing for a Sea of Change, a conference with the government and the private sector to discuss comprehensive tax reform. And here at Tax Analyst, we're big fans of you know governmental transparency. This is what we, we work for um, and we fight for. And so we see great merit in really holding these public discussions on important issues that are going to affect people's economic lives and, and possibly very soon. So if we're going to radically alter the nation's tax system, we really want it done in a way that at least stakeholders all have an opportunity to you know, say, stay informed and say you know, how they feel about it. So in regards to this upcoming conference, on, it's on April 20th. Um, who will be speaking? You know, what are the issues that are going to be explored? What can we expect to learn? Yeah, so th thanks for that. Um, we, uh, I'm very excited. I think we're all very excited at DC Bar, Tax Analyst, and, and Jones Day to be able to put on this type of event. It's an all-day event, and it all started in essence because we saw this fast-moving train called tax reform potentially coming out of nowhere yes. with a brand new, I don't want to use the word radical, but significantly different structure that would be put in yes. place if it passed. And the concern some of us had was that there was a lot of discussions and meetings going on in Washington, some public, some not, uh, where you had uh, the actual uh, the actual representatives and senators speaking about at a very high level about tax, but there was no weeds involved, and we all know the devil's in the details. Absolutely. So the concern was that this train was running really fast, and that there wouldn't be an opportunity um, for there to be a, a real, a more thoughtful technical discussion about the different the different ideas for tax reform. So some of my uh, colleagues at both uh, at, at DC Bar, including Alex and, and our friends on the other on the Hill, suggested that this might be a good way to do it. Sure. So that's sure. how it started. And it turned into an all-day event. Uh, we have, uh, I think, something like 14 or 15 panels. Uh, in addition, we have some keynote speakers as well. We're going to be covering all topics of it under the sun with respect to tax reform. So we're going to be having panels specifically on the uh, on the cash flow piece, on the destin on the border adjustment. We're then going to see the impact of the breakout panels on nine different industry sectors to discuss all the, the unique consequences of these taxes on each of those industries. Um, in addition, and maybe most importantly, we've been given access to the the, the people that are drafting the legislation. So. Um, so we have uh, we have Barbara Angus and her crew over at Ways and Means. We have Mark Prater and his crew over on Senate Finance. Um, we also have folks from Treasury and from Joint Committee. Uh, we have Tom Bartle, um, who is running uh, uh, the uh, uh, Joint Committee on Taxation. We'll be giving a keynote address uh, at lunch. In addition, there'll be panels on on Hatch's proposal for um, uh, various uh, corporate integration uh, structures. So. We think we've covered all our bases here. We think this is a kind of a unique, one-of-a-kind uh, event, and we're looking forward to uh, a robust discussion. Absolutely, and there's still time to register. If, you, if you're gonna be in town, if you are interested in the discussion, you should really try and make it, because it's, it, like you said, it's, going, it's very important, and it's going to be fantastic. So I think we've learned a lot here. We've talked about so much. There's still so much to cover. Um, so I really appreciate you both joining us. You're welcome. It was a wonderful discussion. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we will see you next Wednesday.